Labor Day weekend sermons uh, can go in many directions. Uh, in the past, on this occasion, I, I've preached on the value of work and a variety of other topics specific to the holiday. Uh, today, I, I feel led in a different direction, and so I'm going to follow that prompting. <clears throat> a few years back, I shared with you that while we lived in Kentucky, we were there for nearly 10 years, uh, we once attended a Rick Gage evangelistic crusade. That's Freddie Gage's son. Um, and on the night we attended, uh, Rick Stanley was the guest speaker, the guest evangelist. Now some of you may recognize that name. I imagine most will not. Rick Stanley was the half-brother of Elvis Presley. His mother married Vernon Presley, Elvis's father, and Rick grew up at Graceland, Elvis's home there in Memphis. Um, you ever been to Graceland, anybody, by the way? It, yeah, I, I went there several years back. I was a little surprised, honestly. I thought it would be bigger than it was. But uh, it was preserved. It was a time capsule. It was thoroughly enjoyable. I recommend you go. It, it's a good time. But uh, it, it'll, it'll cause the nostalgia to come back, that's for sure. But uh, Rick Stanley grew up there in Graceland, at Graceland. And prior to that event occurring, he'd been in a boarding school in Virginia with his two brothers. It was a very negative, very abusive environment as he described it that night at the crusade. But needless to say, his life changed dramatically and suddenly upon his mother's remarriage. He went from living in obscurity and poverty to being the brother of one of the biggest stars, perhaps the biggest star in the world. And of course, Rick benefited greatly from his new position in life. And over time, like so many in this world who fall into great fortune, they also fall into a sinful lifestyle. Now later on, he came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord changed his life. And Rick served as an evangelist and an associate pastor for many years. I just found this out recently. He died uh, last year. And I wasn't aware of that. My point in, Rick, in mentioning Rick is that he serves as a great example of someone who grew up in the shadow of his brother. Rick was known primarily because of his brother's identity, not his own achievements. He was never the main attraction. But he was always part of the supporting cast. And I use that illustration today because I'm preaching on a biblical character whose life followed a pattern somewhat similar to that of Rick Stanley 2,000 years earlier. My topic this morning is our Lord's disciple Andrew, the Apostle Peter's brother. And though the setting and the circumstances certainly are, are different in many ways, Andrew also was always in the shadows compared to his brother Peter just as Rick Stanley played second fiddle to Elvis. I haven't covered Andrew in a message in several years. And as I was considering his life recently, I recognized, I realized how relatable he is to so many in the Christian world today. And my prayer is this morning that our examination of his life will be a great encouragement to your heart as you seek to serve Christ just as you are, with the skills, the abilities, the gifting that you have, maybe you're doing better than you realize. We'll see. Certainly the obvious questions that come to mind when you consider someone like Andrew is this. Did Andrew allow his supporting role status to discourage him? Was he jealous? Did he attempt to force his way into the limelight, rebelling against his God-given role? Subordination is a difficult thing. Submission, not a popular topic. Never has been. Or was he content to serve the Lord right where the Master had put him? We'll look at those questions and a few more along the way. The truth is, most Christians alive today, and in fact most who have ever lived or ever will live, are not called to be in the limelight or to be in prominent positions. I'll tell you something else. 
most preachers are not called to preach in huge uh, auditoriums. Uh, I was watching Little House on the Prairie uh, recently. Nothing wrong with that. I'll tell you, it's a great relief to me to see that as opposed to the programming that's on right now anyway. And I was watching, I was just happening flipping channels and it came on and they had the old preacher on there. <clears throat> so, and, I, and of course I stopped then. And I want to hear what he had to say. And it, they had one charlatan, maybe you watched it this past week, there was a charlatan on there who was going around a snake oil salesman that was stealing his congregation. And the faithful man of God there was discouraged. And he saw his flock leave him for the latest fad, the slick new preacher along the way. Um, they're in Walnut Grove, the fictitious town. Anyway, uh, as time went on, the, the old man, uh, the old preacher was eventually restored and he was found out to be the right one. The other guy was a fraud. But the point of it was simply this. The, the, the old preacher said this towards the end of that episode. And, and it's so true. Uh, it was real life examples. He said, when I first started off in ministry, I wanted to preach to large congregations, large crowds, and then I realized I was called to be a simple preacher. Now that's Hollywood. I realize it was filmed in California. I know all about it. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of truth in that. A whole lot of truth. I can't tell you how many preachers I've known over the years who thought they were going to be the next uh, Billy Graham, the next Charles Stanley, the next Adrian Rogers, or whatever the case might have been. And uh, along the way, it didn't pan out that way. Not to say they weren't awesome. Not to say they weren't called of God, but God didn't call them to the huge platform. And one way you can tell if you're really in submission to God is if God puts you in a supporting role, if He doesn't give you what you want but what you need, are you submissive to that? Are you at peace with it? That's a real battle, I tell you, in professional ministry. So many people thought, well, I thought I'd be at First Baptist Orlando or Dallas or something. And when that doesn't pan out, they get discouraged and they go do something else. Again, it's not unique to the layman. It's across the board. Those who are in music ministry, those who are missionaries, some want a more prominent role than perhaps they've been given. The reality is all people, clergy, laymen, whatever it might have been, both now, in the past, in the future, most believers in Jesus Christ are called to serve God under modest Circumstances. There are clearly exceptions, but most people are called to serve out of the limelight where compliments, accolades, recognition are not that common. You don't get a lot of pats on the back in those circumstances. Yet we are called to serve God faithfully nonetheless. Andrew is a model of what it means to be faithful to God right where he has placed you. And we can all learn from his fidelity. So the title this morning is Serving in the Shadows. <clears throat> Serving in the Shadows. Our first text, John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. I'll read just a portion of verse 42. John 1, verse 35 to 42. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God... When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which translated is Peter. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Verse 35, The next day John was there. Again, with two of his disciples. Now, the John referred to here, don't get this mixed up. It's not John the Apostle, it's John the Baptist. Remember, the Bible describes John the Baptist as the voice of one calling out in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord, John 1 and 23. He proclaimed the coming Messiah. His role was preordained before he was even born, if you recall. And John proclaimed 
He was not worthy to untie the sandals of the one who would soon be coming. A reference, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let me say a word about that. Unworthy to untie the sandals, the thong of his sandal. Let me explain something. In the ancient world, in this setting, teachers of Scripture were not typically paid monetarily, at least in this setting. What happened was those students would perform personal favors. They would do what they could do for their master in return for his great knowledge and sharing such things. But there was a practice at that time. Uh, there was a limit to how far that went. And the one thing no person would do outside of a slave was to untie somebody's sandals. That was the worst possible thing. Again, you're walking around dusty roads in that world, no pavement, of course, and the feet were extremely dirty. That was that task of dealing with sandals and feet was left to the slave class. And yet, what does John the Baptist say? I'm not worthy to even untie his sandal. I'm not even worthy of the slave's task. That's how great he is. That's where I'm at. Do you think John understood it? I think he was starting to. John was very outspoken and aggressive in what he had to say about Christ. Again, did he have his moments of doubt? I, I think he did. He's human. Did he have moments? Are you really the one? And so forth. I don't have time to address that today. John was a human. But on the whole, on the balance, how God-honoring it is to read of his boldness in proclaiming Christ's appearance here on the earth. <clears throat> John 3 and 28, he states very clearly, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. And of course, a phrase I use often comes from the lips of John the Baptist, his subordination to Christ. I, uh, he must increase, I must decrease. John 3 and 30. That should be the motto of our lives right there. And if you recall, John is also the man who baptized Jesus... And when that event occurred, John made it very clear he deserved no such honor. Matthew 3, verses 13 through 15 describe it. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Can you imagine what it would have been like for Christ to suddenly appear there in the presence of John the Baptist seeking baptism? John just going through his day, and all of a sudden a very unique man arrives seeking baptism. Now again, you must remember, if you remember your Bible history, John's the cousin of Christ. But it has often been speculated by theologians, at what point did John the Baptist recognize that the carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth, his cousin, was the Messiah? And of course, it, on, on balance in Scripture, it, it seems at the time of Christ's baptism was the moment. He, he might have suspected sooner than that, but I think the moment it all became very clear to him was on the moment... He baptized Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit came down. That cemented it for him. More on that in a moment. At this juncture, early on, it, he wasn't completely clear on what was going on. John 1, verses 31 to 34, a New American Standard. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, this is God speaking to John, a direct revelation, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So God speaks to the heart of John the Baptist, the forerunner. Jesus is the one on the occasion of his baptism. So in, in verse 35 of our text, we find John the Baptist with two of his disciples... And verse 40 tells us Andrew is one of these two disciples. The other person not identified specifically here, though it has long been held, the other one is no other than John the Apostle. Right here is an eyewitness of what he saw on this awesome occasion. Now it was not unusual for ancient religious teachers to have their own disciples. And John had several followers at this time. 
regarding Andrew, the fact that he was following John the Baptist, a man of God, the real McCoy at that juncture in time, the best available at that moment prior to Christ coming along. The fact that Andrew followed John the Baptist tells us something about his character. Andrew was a man who was serious about spiritual issues. He wasn't like so many men along the corridors of time across the centuries who've been silent about the things of Christ, who've been quiet about the things of God. He was outspoken. He wasn't hiding from church. He wasn't hiding from the proclamation of the Word of God. He wasn't finding every excuse not to be under the hearing of God's Word. Of course, there are multitudes of men who've walked the good, fought the good fight and walked the good walkway. We know the good path. We know that. But so often men don't do that. And they fail their household. Andrew was a man who was serious about spiritual issues. He sought the truth diligently. He genuinely hungered for true godly understanding. Now he was not the leader of the pack as I've made clear. Nor the most prominent disciple. But even in these early stages we can see he takes his faith very seriously. He wanted to learn. He hungered for truth. Is that true of you today? Do you hunger for truth? Do you want your understanding to be deepened? Do you yearn for the things of God? Does nothing thrill your soul like the things of God? In verse 36, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. So again, at this juncture, the, the baptism had already occurred. It seems very clear he fully recognizes who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And, and so in verse 36... Because John had received a direct revelation from God, when Christ comes into sight, John the Baptist, with no hesitation, tells two of his followers, and I'll paraphrase here, take careful note of this, pay extremely close attention, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. You who follow me, He's the one. And when He made that statement, John effectively put an end to his own career as a prophet. One whose role was to proclaim the coming Messiah and he began telling the world instead, the Lord has arrived, he's here. He's now with us in the flesh. As a matter of fact, he's standing right there. Follow him now. In verse 37, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. And the scholar Thomas Constable observes this. Two of John the Baptist's disciples started following Christ because of John's witness. This was perfectly proper since John's ministry was to point others to Jesus. They were not abandoning John the Baptist for a more popular teacher. They were simply doing what John urges his hearers to do. They began following Jesus Christ in person to learn from him. So John the Baptist, the one who cried out there in the wilderness, he has completed his task. He pointed to the Savior and now the Savior is standing there in their midst. And verse 38 continues, Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So Andrew and John, the future author of the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, the Revelation the one to whom Christ entrusted his earthly mother, they began following the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they do so, our Lord turns around and says, what do you want? That's a very simple and a reasonable question, isn't it? Normally it would be just that, a simple question. However, what dramatically changes the entire narrative is the fact that Jesus Christ is the one asking the question. He knows all things. There is no knowledge you can provide to the one who knows the end from the beginning. So what is meant by the Lord's inquiry? Andreas Kostenberger is a scholar of the book of John. And he said this, Beneath the surface, however, the question is both probing and challenging. And considering both the identity of the questioner and the fourth evangelist penchant for double meanings, that is John, it is hard to believe that the question is not on a secondary level meant to challenge also the readers of John's gospel to ask themselves what it is they are looking for. Let me translate what the doctor says there. 
as you read this, ask yourself, what are you looking for? What do you want when it comes to Jesus Christ? And Andrew and John's reply was a bit odd. Where are you staying? Now, it doesn't seem to answer the question the Lord asked them. Are accommodations really that big a deal? Perhaps they weren't sure what to say. Maybe they were shy. Maybe they were intimidated. We don't know. But after all, put yourself in Andrew's shoes for a moment. The spiritual leader you had been following, that is John the Baptist, a man you have great respect and admiration for, and rightfully so, has just called Jesus the Lamb of God. So your master is praising and lifting up Jesus Christ with that statement. And now the elevated master, the real McCoy, is asking you what you want. Kind of puts you on the spot, doesn't it? So it's understandable, I think, that Andrew and John will be a bit tongue-tied, overwhelmed to encounter the Lord face to face. If you and I had been there, can you imagine the intensity of that moment? They were serious about their faith. This is not a casual event. John the Baptist says, this is God incarnate. And then God asks you, what do you want? Well, the fact they've been inquiring about where Christ is staying implies perhaps they have deep, <clears throat> extensive questions that can't be addressed sufficiently there on the spot. It might have been they wanted to talk to Christ in a private setting. And if that theory is correct... That reveals once again the depth of Andrew's spiritual curiosity and the seriousness with which he takes his faith. In verse 39, Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. The tenth hour is a reference to 4 p.m. In the Jewish method of timekeeping, the day was observed from sunset to sunset. Using that model, without going into excessive detail, the tenth hour is four in the afternoon. And at that time, perhaps it was starting to get dark. In this time of history, remember, there were no electric lights. The only light available at night was primitive lighting with fire. And it was imperative to get where you were going to sleep, have those arrangements made well in advance of when darkness actually fell. So it seems to me Andrew and John spent that night with Jesus. What would that have been like? What topics did they discuss? What questions did they ask the Lord? Can you imagine what it would have been like to have had a private audience with Jesus Christ in the flesh, understanding fully who he was, and receiving direct instruction from the source himself? What a night that must have been. You know, we'll find out in eternity what actually went on in that meeting. The wonder of it all. And one source puts it this way. They first had to come with him, and then they would see. This statement was also highly significant spiritually. Only by coming to Jesus could they really comprehend what they were seeking spiritually. The same thing holds true today. So in verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. So here, very clearly, Andrew, one of the two. And the first thing verse 41 says Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. This is a very important verse. After leaving the presence of our Lord, what is the very first thing Andrew did? He sought to find his brother, Peter, and tell him about Jesus. What does that tell us? Andrew's one of the first evangelists. One of the first missionaries. Dr. Kostenberger notes, Every time Andrew is mentioned in this gospel, he is described as bringing or referring someone to Jesus. In John chapter 6, to illustrate this, we find the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 where Christ feeds the multitudes with one boy's lunch, five loaves of bread and two small fishes. In that account, do you recall who it is that brings the boy to Jesus Christ? Andrew. Yet Andrew, so often behind the scenes, playing second fiddle to others most of his life, but he is the one who consistently, as a matter of practice, brought others to Christ, including... Most famously, his brother, the Apostle Peter. 
Speaking of Peter's life, how significant was it that he came to Christ? Well, what about the day of Pentecost? What happened when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost? 3,000 people were saved. Andrew was in the shadows, but I believe his reward is great in heaven. Why do I say that? Because he faithfully witnessed to his own brother who turned out to be one of the greatest reapers of souls. You know, there are a few key lessons I want to spend a moment on here we can learn from Andrew's life that are very important, very applicable in this day and time. First of all, God greatly uses people behind the scenes in supporting roles. He always has, he always will. Andrew had to be humble and not jealous of the fact that his brother Peter, his famous brother, the one that he introduced to Christ in the first place, became effectively the leader of the disciples. Now, was Peter the first pope? Perish the thought. Of course not. That's gibberish. But was Peter the leader of the disciples? Sure, I'll grant you that. So Andrew's probably thought, wait a second. I'm the one that introduced you to. Well, Andrew was not known for being a great public speaker. Maybe he was. But he's not noted for that. But he used the personality that he had. He used the gifting that he had. He used the opportunities he was given to their maximum effect in the Lord's work. <clears throat> now, if you're someone today whose gifting spiritually is in the area of general service, being a helper, helping wherever there is a need, serving wherever you have skills in the church, be encouraged. The church would not function without those who are serving behind the scenes, not seeking recognition, but simply doing the things that need to be done that the Lord lays on their hearts. Unseen, unrecognized, but totally needed. I won't name names today. Washing the robes after baptism. Cutting the grass. Helping to clean out. Helping with repairs on the building. Helping with administrative tasks. Things like that. Counting money. Whatever it might be. General service. And I'm leaving many things out there. <clears throat> but how many true heroes are there in the church that we take for granted? We walk right past week after week. God sees their service in the shadows. And that's what matters. He said, nobody knows what I'm doing, preacher. I'm discouraged. I'm giving this up. Nobody even appreciates me. No human being may appreciate you properly. I'm sure we've failed many people. And I'm sure I have. Unintentionally, but it's happened. But friend, God sees it all. And when you serve Him, you have never wasted your time. Secondly, Andrew was actively looking to bring those he encountered to Jesus Christ. Now, Peter's work was vitally important when he was preaching to large crowds. Andrew, on the contrary, seemed laser-focused on bringing one individual at a time to Christ. And the Lord greatly blessed his work. Dr. Glenn Cummings shares a statistic I hope really gets your attention this morning. About 2% of believers were first reached through gospel tracts or advertising. Now, I love gospel tracts. But you put out a lot of them, you get a very small return, but the return's worth it. About 2% of people are reached that way. 6% of those that come to Christ that he's aware of in the survey were saved through a pastoral visit. Well, right now, pastoral visitation is not a real popular thing. Why? I don't want you in my living room. COVID-19. 6% through other visits. That would be deacons, Sunday school teachers, etc. 85% of people who come to Christ were first reached through family or friends. 85%. Please hear me very carefully. Most people who ever come to Christ don't come because of the preacher or some other prominent person. They come to Christ because someone they know and trust tells them about the Lord. Think about your own salvation experience. Now you may be the opposite of that. You might have been saved in a Billy Graham crusade. I praise God if you did. But in this circumstance, the vast majority come because of the influence of someone close to them. At least initially. 
You can make a tremendous impact for Christ in your personal, individual witnessing efforts. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to be a scholar. Simply tell them what Jesus Christ has done for you. Third, as I mentioned a moment ago, God will reward you for the fruit that comes from those you witnessed to and led to Christ. Andrew was an individual soul winner. And a portion of the reward that was due from their service went to him. How do I know this? Philippians chapter 4, Paul is thanking the church at Philippi for supporting him financially in his work. In verse 17, Paul says, Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. Consider also Romans 2 and 6. God will give to each person according to what he has done. God rewards those who work for him. The Bible teaches rewards. And I am convinced that when a Christian faithfully serves and produces fruit, both that individual and those in his spiritual lineage, that is, those who brought him to Christ, they receive a portion of that reward. God rewards those who serve him. Finally, what became of Andrew after Christ's resurrection? Well, most historical sources, and they are varied and debated, but most say that Andrew's Christian service continued. Some say in the region of Russia, Greece, among other locations. It seems to be generally agreed upon by scholars that Andrew was martyred for the faith. And one account goes like this. A Greek proconsul was greatly offended because Andrew had done the heinous act, committed this act of healing his ailing wife and then he led both her and the proconsul's brother to faith in Jesus Christ. So he healed her, brought her to faith in Christ, also healed the ruler's brother and soon thereafter this ruler ordered Andrew's execution. And one historical document says this, the official ordered Andrew to forsake his religion or be tortured fiercely. Each begged the other to recant, that is, the proconsul on Andrew. The official urged Andrew not to lose his life. Andrew, in return, urged the official not to lose his soul. Now I'm going to pause there for a moment. Can you imagine that? You have a personal apostle of Jesus Christ. The first to follow him, telling you to your face, don't lose your soul. And it doesn't stop you? Well, after patiently bearing scourging that is beaten almost to death, Andrew was tied, not nailed to a cross, that his suffering might be prolonged. Andrew hung upon the cross for two days, exhorting all who Witness. Let me translate that. In other words, Andrew was witnessing to those who were watching his torturous execution. For two days he was witnessing. Can you imagine how powerful that preaching would have been? Maybe he wasn't in the limelight in the past. He was at that point. One of Christ's first and most dedicated personal soul winners... In the act of giving his life for Christ, he was compelling that crowd to trust Jesus Christ. How many were saved in his last act of dedication to the Master? Remember when Stephen was the first Christian martyr after Christ went back to heaven? Christ stood up there at the Father's right hand. Christ stood to his feet to receive Stephen's spirit. What about Andrew? How do you think our Lord reacted to that? Can you imagine the comfort Andrew received in his soul? Can you imagine the vigor and the fire and all of it that Andrew was presenting at that time? How could Andrew be witnessing and concerned only about bringing others to faith in Christ as he's being tortured to death? How could he have that fire? How could he have that assurance? Very simply. He had seen Jesus Christ in the flesh after death. He knew what he was teaching was the absolute truth. Well, I close this morning with an illustration that comes from Dr. Travis Agnew. I ask you to listen carefully. 
Back uh, in the 19th century, there was a Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball. And he had a class filled with boys that didn't want to behave. Maybe you've been there before. A Sunday school class of children that would not cooperate. They just wanted to roughhouse. Well, Mr. Kimball loved the boys. He wanted to see them all saved. He prayed specifically for them. And there was one boy in particular that just didn't seem to get it. Maybe you've been there also. The gospel just confused him apparently. So Mr. Kimball went to the shoe store where the young man worked on a Saturday. As a result of that visit, D.L. Moody, a man who would go on to be called the greatest evangelist of the 19th century, one of the greatest soul winners in history, was saved. Under the preaching of D.L. Moody, a man named Wilbur Chapman was saved, also became an evangelist. And in one of Mr. Chapman's meetings, a baseball player was in attendance, and he was born again. That young professional baseball player's name, Billy Sunday. Well, Billy Sunday left baseball, became a legendary full-time evangelist in his own right. Also saved under Mr. Chapman's preaching was a young man named Mordecai Ham, who, not surprisingly, became an evangelist. Who is Mordecai Ham's most famous convert? A fellow by the name of Billy Graham. Billy Graham, as of 2008, had preached to more than 2 billion people. When you consider his radio, his television audiences. Therefore, Billy Graham preached the gospel to more people than any other preacher or evangelist ever, including the Apostle Paul. Just think of all the souls who will be in heaven because of the faithfulness of one unknown Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball, a man who, for all he knew, was just praying for the rough boys in his Sunday school class. Way leads on to way. Mr. Kimball wasn't famous. He wasn't in the limelight. But his faithfulness started at a, this whole chain of events that ultimately ended in the conversion of Billy Graham and several other great evangelists along the way. Can you imagine the reception Edward Kimball, the unknown Sunday school teacher, received when he got there to glory land? The fruit, the reward, the well done. A man who was serving God right where God had placed him. Not getting credit, not getting pats on the back. He was faithful. And the world was changed. To make a huge impact in the Lord's work, you don't have to be prominent. You don't have to be up on this platform or any other. Just like Andrew, just like Mr. Kimball, you just have to be faithful and obedient right where he has placed you. And a key aspect in being obedient to Christ is sharing his gospel faithfully. You never know when you might be in the presence of, the, of a person who could become the next great evangelist, the next D.L. Moody, the next Billy Graham, if only someone would tell him about Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, I come to you today praying for encouragement, for me, for this audience, for those who will see this later. Lord, help us all to recognize that what we do is important. We're called to be faithful right where we are with the gifting, the abilities, the opportunities that we have. And Lord, help us to understand if we're doing all that we can where we are, we should take comfort in that and continue to serve you with zeal as best we can. Not longing for someone else's platform, not looking for someone else's opportunity, but being content where we are, faithfully serving you. Lord, have your way in this invitation. Encourage believers, save those who are lost. May you be glorified, may you be pleased. In your mighty name I pray, King Jesus. Amen. Serving in the shadows. You can't begin serving till you know Jesus Christ.
Before you can serve, you must begin the journey. How do you begin the journey? By trusting Christ. How do you trust Him? Simply as, he, as you are, you come to Him. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. You just come to Christ as you are. Just call upon Him right where you are. Something like this, in your heart. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. And Lord Jesus Christ, right now I trust you and you alone as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. You're the only way. I'm all in, Lord Jesus Christ. Save me. Change my life. Help me, Lord, to serve you. Salvation's, it, salvation's a gift from God. Don't complicate it. Receive it empty-handed. Knowing He's going to change you. Knowing He's going to prompt you to serve Him. But it all begins as a free gift. Will you receive that gift today? Maybe you've been saved but not baptized. If not, the first thing you should do is be baptized. Those waters are not magical. They don't save you. But they're indicative of the fact you have trusted Christ. You're saved first, then you're baptized. Don't get that order reversed, by the way. Have you been baptized since you were saved? If not, you need to be. Make me aware of that. Maybe you need to join this church. If so, come forward. We'd love to receive you. Perhaps there's some other need in your life. I'll do all I can to help you. But whatever you have need of, this is your opportunity. If nothing else, I hope today you've recognized the need to be faithful where you are. In the circle God has given you with the, with the understanding, the learning, the intelligence you have. Serve God where you are the best that you can. That's what he's holding you accountable for. Not for someone else's pathway. Not for what you might have wanted to do. You're accountable for where you are. Are you serving him as best you can right now?